Shalom, shalom, my brothers and sisters. Well, I will be on later today with the Bible reading, but for now, um, we'll, we'll pick up back in Acts, but I'm excited to get back into our study in Revelation. I really want to just do some smaller videos right now as we uh, do the seven churches in chapter two and three. So we're going to take it a church at a time, and then you can, I don't know how many I'll do this week, but we're going to take it so that you can refer to that church. But I, So I'm going to read from Revelation chapter 2. I'm reading from King James Version. And verses 1 to 7, I believe, here. Yes, I think that's right. Yes. <clears throat> Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Now, if you don't understand what I'm referring to, go back to video one. You're, go you're going to want to hear video one because I give explanation of these figures of speech that the Lord is using. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars. Now, I want to stop there for a second. There are some who are coming out, and they are so deceived. They believe that they hear from God on YouTube now, and they're using Revelation 2, 2, and saying that the apostle Paul was a liar, and Jesus is saying that here. Wrong. That is just, they are not hearing from God. They, I believe they're hearing. But they are not hearing from Holy Spirit. They are not hearing from the Lord. They are, they are not, many of them, even saved. They have never trusted in the finished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. If you don't know what I'm talking about, the ABCs of salvation is in the description box. The apostle saying that is anti the word of God. We believe that all of the Bible is infallible and inerrant. It, I'm not even going to go into why that's wrong. If you don't know that, we've got some basic issues here. And it's sad. Just pray for them. Mark and avoid them. It's it's very sad to hear those kind of things. And there's not one. There are several that are he adhering that I know of two that are really prominently just going at the Apostle Paul, calling him a liar, saying Jesus called him that. And they use Revelation 2 too. That is not it. So I'm going to read that again. I know thy works and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of this out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which also hate, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So let's take this. Now, first, I want to give some background on a, a little bit more. Um, in chapters two and three, we have individual letters addressed to the seven churches of Asia, which is modern day Turkey. The letters may be applied in a couple ways. First of all, they describe conditions that actually existed in the seven local churches at the time John was writing. Secondly, they give a view of Christendom on earth at any one time in its history. The feature found in these letters have existed in part, at least in every century since Pentecost. In this respect, the letters bear marked resemblances to the seven parables of Matthew 13. So that's something that you may want to go back. I'll give you references. They bear um, resemblance, marked resemblance, 
to the seven parables of Matthew 13. These letters do. So keep that in mind. Um, many believe, many theologians believe that the first three letters are consecutive and that the last four are concurrent, reaching to the time of the rapture. So after, so, and we're going to see the conditions, right? We, we can apply these conditions to the church today. And we're just in the United States, over 50% of churches no longer believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by him. And out of that 50%, there's a marked number that do not believe that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. There are over 200 verses, solo fide. And this, this is where we're, we're seeing the transition as we come to the end. But then the rapture. So keep that in mind. Um so I tend to agree with that. Now, I want to go verse by verse from my notes. All right, and I've got some in my Bible here. I actually, my notebooks are full, so I sometimes have to copy um, even from them. So the Lord introduces himself to the church of Ephesus as the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Most of the descriptions of the Lord in these letters are similar to that which is found in chapter 1. So we already went over that yesterday. This church was outstanding for its plentiful works. So they did a lot of works. And it's labor and its patient endurance. It did not tolerate evil men in its midst. It had the ability to discern false apostles and to deal with them accordingly. Now, I have had experiences in churches where I've had to do the same thing, deal with that. Um, literally, we had a highly recommended man. This was just, I think, like a year ago. Someone, by people that we trusted, and I had to pull him down. We, we invited him to speak on a Sunday evening. And I literally stopped him and then had him sit down while I corrected the error. And what he, it, it was sad. And I don't like doing that. That's why we try to vet those. But we have, as a pastor, I have to, you know, that's a calling. It doesn't make me better, but it's a calling. So we don't want people teaching uh, another, a false gospel or teaching and error. And I'm not talking about things you hear me say all the time. If you believe, listen, being, I'm pre-tribulation rapture. After what we, after chapter three, right, we're raptured. And so um, if you don't believe that, you believe we're mid or post, but you are saved solo fide, we, you're still my brother and sister. That doesn't have to be a fellowship thing. I'm talking about anyone who preaches another gospel, not going to happen in the pulpit that I've been assigned to. And so I have to protect. I love this body. I love you guys. It's like if I had someone, I, I thought that they were a grace believer, that they were a solo fide, saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, and they got on here and they started, I would shut them down. I would put them in. That, no way. We're not going to tolerate that. So verses 3 and 4. For the sake of Christ's name, it had endured trial and adversity with patience and had labored tirelessly for the sake of Christ's name. But the tragedy of Ephesus was that it had left its first love. The fire of its affection had died down. The glowing enthusiasm of its early days had disappeared. The Christians could look back to better days when their bridal love for Christ flowed warm, full, and free. They were still sound in doctrine and active in service, but the true motive of all worship and service was missing. Now, I want to say this. Remember, this is to the church. And he's talking to this body, this church, this fellowship, this assembly. This is not about the individual believer losing their salvation. And anybody who's been in, married and in a relationship, you'd like to say that, the, that you have that loving feeling all the time. But that would be a lie. Yet the covenant 
You didn't break the covenant. And the fact is, the covenant, the new covenant in his blood was made between father and son. We can't even break it. The nanosecond, when we admit we're a sinner in need of a savior, the nanosecond, we believe that Christ died for our sins, shed his blood and paid the debt for our sins once and for all, was buried and on the third day rose from the dead. Boom. You are that nanosecond you believe, saved, sealed, and sanctified until the day of redemption. You are born again and dwelt with Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. You can't be unborn. You, The Bible, Ephesians 4.30, Ephesians 1.13 and 14, talk about our eternal security. But this is talking about the church body. And I'm going to, let's be honest here. There are a lot of people in churches at, who aren't even saved. And there are a lot of churches that get so caught up and doing good works and, and meeting the needs of people and making great plans. And I am not, listen, I am not being critical of anybody's worship style, but doing the smoke and mirrors, the smoke machines, all that stuff. Some like that, some don't. That's not my point. My point is we can, we are to worship God in spirit and in truth, build one another up in the faith and reach out to a lost and dying world. We are under lockdown as I make this video. And so for me as lead pastor, I am doing the, the, ser the services solo, <laughs> solo. And that's not, that, that's not my desire to do that, but we're going to keep proclaiming the gospel and preaching. And so I simply get up. I'm not a worship leader, but I'll sing a couple choruses that, that we can join together online or a hymn. No music, but so what? That's not the thing. We're focusing on him. We're, we're joining in and praising and worshiping and then taking communion together. You get the elements and, and then the word. Praise God. It's no glory to me, all the glory to God. It doesn't matter, does it? Because at the end of the day, it's about him. It's not about the great program we can put on the, you know, and again, I'm not against people who have the music playing while they're preaching. I don't. I just, we just bring the word. Hallelujah. Uh, the word is alive, Hebrews 4.12. And active, sharper than a double-edged sword, piercing between bone and marrow, soul and spirit, and is a judge and discerner of the motives and intentions of the heart. Praise God. And his word will not return unto him void. Verse 5. They should remember the good days of their early faith. Repent of their diminishing of first love. Now, this is not about the individual person's salvation. This is, he's writing to the church. But there's repentance unto salvation, which is metanoia, a change of mind, a change of heart. After 1 John chapter 1 is written to believers. And so, if we confess, when we know we've done something, we confess, you're already saved. But, and I've done it, sermon on that. That confession, when, when you're doing those things, that's not about your salvation. That's about your fellowship. And in this essence, the efficacy and the, the what I want to say, the, the purpose that God has planned for this body, for this assembly, can be diminished. And, and their efficacy, we're going to get to that as we talk about these churches. So I want to clarify that. So they should remember the... Now, after we're saved, there is godly sorrow, which is translated repentance. That's not metanoia. See, that's a different word. That is metamalamai, and that is godly sorrow. You're already saved. Now, because Holy Spirit... Now, this is to the individual. I'm not talking about the letter right now. Metamalami is godly sorrow, where you want to honor God, you want to be in obedience, and so you feel it. And you're not even, it's Holy Spirit convicting you, not condemning you in sin, because sin can no longer judicially be held to your account. Temporally, we if we sin, that can still lead to death, that can still lead to consequence. If I do certain sins, I could literally die from it but I don't lose my salvation. I'll be in the presence of the Lord because I have believed on the Son of God. Romans 10, 13, all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Again, the ABCs of salvation is in the description box. But for the church here, and I have stood in the gap 
for churches I've been a member of and for communities when we have done things that we shouldn't have done. There are sins of omission, things we should do that we don't do, sins of commission, things we do do, and sins of thought. And we'll have 70,000 thoughts a day. Again, I'm talking to individuals here, not to the church. We'll have 70,000 thoughts. Not every thought will be to God's standard of moral perfection. And when I recognize, of course, I want to confess. I've asked Holy Spirit to put me on autopilot for that. But I'm not saved by that because I'm already saved. It doesn't maintain my salvation. And this heresy, this lie that salvation is a process and you won't know to the end, that's a lie. That I'm telling you what, that is a lie. Do not follow that, that teaching. It is an event. The nanosecond you believe, you are saved, sealed, and sanctified until the day of redemption. So he's saying they should remember the good days of their early faith. Repent, turn from the diminishing of first love. Turn from that. Um, and again, this is to the church. We could even say, have a change of mind, a change of heart, right? Remember and repeat the devoted service. Again, this is to the church, not the individual. We're not saved by service. The efficacy of the church and the service needs to be spirit-led, what God has ordained and destined for them. Um, devoted service, which characterized the outset of the efficacy of this church. Otherwise, he would remove the lampstand at Ephesus. That is the assembly. This is important. Get this. Because so many people think, well, you'll lose your salvation. No, no. Eh, wrong. That's not what this is saying. He would remove the lampstand at Ephesus, and that means the assembly would cease to exist. Its testimony would die out. That's what he said. In these churches, uh, obviously they did cease to exist. Now remember, there were real churches, but these things have, we can apply them to all the churches and all the centuries since then, and we are at the final moments, the end of a dispensation. Verse 6, a further word of commendation concerning their hatred of the deeds of the Nicolaitans. We cannot be positive who these people were. Theologians have debated this for years. Some think they were followers of a religious leader named Nicholas. Others point out that the name means Nicolaitans. The name means rule over the laity and see in this a reference to the rise of the clerical system. And I'll tell you what, whew, that religious spirit in the clerical system is something we want to mark and avoid because that is all about man taking the word and making his own what he labels doctrine and making it about works righteousness. And we're seeing it today, the separation of the wheat and tares. It's, so I'm going to say that again. Two main thoughts, because there's different thoughts on this from theologians. One is that there was a, was a leader named Nicholas, and they were following him, who was in error. The others point out that the name means rule over the laity, and see in this a reference to the rise of the clerical system. Be very cautious. Then verse 7, those who have ears to hear God's word are encouraged to listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Then a promise is held out to the overcomer. In general, an overcomer in the New Testament is one who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 1 John 5, 5, boom, that's it. Believe on the Son of God. Now, that's to the individual, right? And I just want to bring that out because there'll be people who say, well, you have to overcome to the end. You don't know if you're saved till the end. Eh, wrong. We are saved and we are overcomers when we believe on Yeshua HaMashiach, on Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Boom. In other words, a true believer, his faith enables him to overcome the world with all its temptations and allurements. 
It's not because of us. It's because of Christ in us. And the nanosecond we believe we are saved, sealed, and sanctified, we are seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. We're not saved by any overcoming. So individually, we are overcomers when we believed. Boom, period, event, done. And then it's Holy Spirit in us. Now, even though I am perfect in position, the nanosecond I believe, I am not perfect in performance. The Apostle Paul tells us that, right? When he, he said, I'm going to give you the Tim paraphrase. When I want to do good, evil is present. When I want to do evil, Holy Spirit is there. And to the believer, he's to the sinner, he's convicting them to sin because he's pointing toward Jesus and the fact that they're sinners. To the believer, he's convicting us to righteousness because we're already saved. And he's reminding us God has better for us. And praise God for that. And Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So in each of the letters, the word has an additional thought connected with the condition in that particular church. Thus, an overcomer in Ephesus may be one who shows the genuineness of his faith. And for the church as the body for recognizing that even though Jesus is saying you've done all these good things, you even you won't tolerate evil. You right. We call sin, sin. We call sin, sin. You hear me preach. I call sin, sin. Praise God. We, we call it what it is because there's a difference between our salvation and discipleship and new believers don't always know, especially in a culture that calls what's evil good and good evil. So we want to point those things out. We want to disciple. We want to teach to the church. And there are churches, there's a lot of churches that they need to allow Holy Spirit, the leaders of those churches, to tell them but it's easy as a church to get caught up into movements and into plans. And are they Holy Spirit led? What, what does it result in? Does it result in numbers? Does it result in money coming into the church? Is that the motive? It, do we have to keep ahead of the budget as we get more programs? And were they God led to begin with? These are just questions I'm putting out there. But at the end of it, is Jesus our first love? And, and I am going to apply this to us individually for you to ask as you pray, is he your first love? You're saved. If you believed, you are saved. I'm married to the loveliest bride in all the land. And, and the question I could ask myself, I'm in covenant relationship. I could, I could be a distant husband and still be in covenant with her. That doesn't change the fact I'm her husband. But am I in close fellowship? And is she my second love? Before I married my wife, um, one of the conversations we had, I said, you will be my second love. There is a place in my soul where only God and now where you can abide because we are going to be one. A place in my heart, but you will be my second love because Jesus is my first love. And there's no glory to me, brothers and sisters, none whatsoever. But that's a place we want to be because it's glorious to be in the manifest presence of the Lord. And so that's a good question. But to the church, to the church, he, he tells them, you've not tolerated this evil of the Nicolaitans. You, like, you, you've, you've done these great things. He's commended them, but you've left your first love. And so... Even as a body, even as church leaders, we can repent. We can say, Lord, we're sorry. Now, remember, I've given you two different words. Metanoia in the life of the believer. Repent, I think it's Mark 16. Repent and believe the gospel. The gospel is what? Christ died for our sins, was buried, and on the third day rose from the dead. His precious blood he shed to pay the debt. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so, um, as a church, now, now the second word in my life, in your life, is godly sorrow, metamalami. 
And that's, you're already a believer. You don't lose your salvation. I know I had an attitude or a thought. And as I, I'll say, Lord, I'm sorry. I know that's not God's best for me. And I know it's wrong. If I know I've done something wrong, I'm going to confess that to him. Um, what if I don't confess it? What if I'm being stubborn? What if I'm being a tantruming child of God and I do something wrong? Maybe I gossiped about someone and Holy Spirit has been convicting me to righteousness. You know that wooing, that still small voice that says, you know that wasn't right. You were at a dinner party and you were talking about that brother. You know that wasn't right. And I, I just, I grieve him. I like, mm, I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to listen. And I die. I have an aneurysm and I die. That's sin, isn't it? I've gossiped and, and I refuse to confess it, to even acknowledge it. I've sinned. That's gossip. Heaven or hell? That's the question. If I gossip about someone and I grieve Holy Spirit and I know, I know he, he's, he's convicting me to righteousness. I know he's recalling the word of God to me. Holy Spirit is trying to show me that's wrong. And I, and I, I, I want to have godly sorrow over that, but I don't. I grieve him. And I breathe my, I have an aneurysm and die. Do I go to heaven or hell? Some would say, well, if you die in that sin and you didn't repent, you're going to hell. And wrong. Because Jesus, his precious blood that he shed on the cross at Calvary was enough. He cried out to tell us die. It is finished. The job is perfect. The debt is paid in full. It's as if Mark stamped, boom, Paid in full. Praise God, brothers and sisters. He did it for us. I absolutely would go to heaven. I have full assurance because the word of God tells me over 200 verses, solo fide, faith plus nothing equals salvation and eternal security. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are we saved through faith and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, lest anyone should boast. Now that being said, there is a powerful, powerful um, message in here to the church. And, and, and it applies to the church today, even though it applied to a, there were, there was a literal church in Ephesus. It applied. And that is, are we being Holy Spirit led? And as a body, even as individuals, right? Ask yourself, ask Holy Spirit to search you. You're saved, praise God. Don't you want to be in close fellowship? I want more of God. I don't know about you, but I do, particularly in these final moments of the end of days because we are in the final moments of the end of days. We don't know the day nor hour, and we want to occupy and redeem the time. And so I don't, even in our human relationships, there are times we're not having the loving feeling. And you know you can, you can get back to that place, can't you? Well, with the Lord, it is so easy. Acknowledge it. Confess it. And watch Holy Spirit do the work. He says, all such will eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. This does not imply that they are saved by overcoming, but that their overcoming proves the reality of their conversion experience. And that's true in the life, but you are not saved by overcoming. I've already covered that. The only way men are saved is by grace through faith in Christ. All who are saved will eat from the tree of life. That is, they will enter into eternal life in its fullness in heaven. We are guaranteed of that. Ephesus is often taken to describe the condition of the church soon after the death of the apostles. And so I hope that, that, that you've been blessed by this teaching on the letter to the church at Ephesus and what that actually means. So many people think, if I don't love him enough, if I don't serve him enough, no. Listen, the Bible is clear. Here's what we, here's what we want to do is save people. We want to be renewed in our minds as the word of God says. Know your identity in Christ. You know what? 
We're talking about Ephesus. Go read Ephesians. That's one of the prison epistles. And that will tell you your identity in Christ. And then be washed in the purity of the truth of God's word. A big part of discipling people after they are saved, after they are saved, an event is discipling them, is leading them in how to be renewed in their mind and how to be washed in the purity of the truth of God's word. And I don't know about you, but my worship to him is living a life that brings glory and honor to him because he's worthy. He's worthy. All the glory to God. Well, God bless you guys. Shalom, shalom, and have an awesome rest of your day.